We have a really great episode this week with Mark Settle, seven-time CIO and author of the recent book, Truth from the Valley, a practical primer on IT management for the next decade. For someone who's known as a big-time CIO, Mark has a very different background. He started out as an Air Force officer and worked for NASA at the beginning of his career. The background reminded me of one of my favorite stories about data and decision-making. It's a story from World War II. It may be a fable. I'm not 100% sure, but this is how I've heard it. So Allied forces were having an unacceptable number of planes shot down over France and Germany, and they were desperate for ways to keep more planes in the air. Adding some extra armor was a natural place to begin. So they went out to their hangars, found the planes that had already flown missions, and examined where the bullet holes were. When they inspected the planes that had already flown, they found that the wings and tails of the plane by far had the most bullet holes, while the engine and the cockpit of the planes were mostly spared. So they slapped on some extra armor on the wings and the tails and they sent the planes back off to Germany, which made sense. They wanted to protect the areas where the planes got shot the most. But then over the coming weeks, just as many planes got shot down as before. It was only then that they realized there was a flaw in their thinking. It wasn't that the engines and cockpits never got shot. In fact, they frequently were. But when they were, the planes crashed and therefore weren't around to be examined back in the hangars. So due to this one seemingly minor flaw in how they approached the problem, the commanders had completely neglected the most critical area of development for their planes. We see something similar in the way decision-making is talked about today, especially in tech. We hear so much from the winners, the great decisions that panned out and made everyone rich and famous. But we're much less likely to talk about our failures, poor decisions, and false starts. And so in a way, we're making the same mistakes as those World War II commanders. We're only learning from the planes that made it back, so to speak. That's one of the reasons we started Truth Be Known, to shine a light on some of those more difficult decisions and examine what really went into them. And I think Mark does a great job of that in this interview. So a big thank you to him for coming on the show. And without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome to Truth Be Known. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Truth Be Known. This is Lauren Vaccarello, your fearless host. And I'm really excited today to have our special guest, Mark Settle. Mark has been a CIO for the better part of forever. He was most recently the CIO at Okta. He's written a couple of incredible books, most recently Truth from the Valley, a practical primer on IT management for the next decade. Uh, We'll end up talking a little bit about some of the insights he had in um, Truth from the Valley. Would love to dig into some of the great work that he did as CIO of Okta, as well as at BMC, Corporate Express, Arrow Electronics, HIS. Mark has tons and tons of experience and really want to dig into this whole idea of decision making. Uh, So, Mark, I gave you a 25 cent introduction. Uh, Would you like to introduce yourself for the the full part? Well, I don't know if you need to add too much more to that. Grew up in upstate New York, spent time in the Air Force, actually early in my career. Had a unique opportunity to work at NASA headquarters uh, early on as well. So um, I've had you know, lots of opportunities. I think you know some people have a kind of a pretty linear progression of career experiences. You, you know, they start as a bank teller and then they end up running the bank. And, and the other people, you know, kind of like a pinball machine career path. And I'm definitely more the, the pinball uh, case history. I honestly, I think those uh, sort of those pinball paths end up lending to the best leaders and the most interesting backgrounds and stories. Yeah, so I just want to start. So, you know, a lot of times when I speak, people will offer an introduction similar to your remarks and start listing some of the places that I've worked. And when I get up, I always remind them that my wife's summary distillation of that whole progression is that I have a hard time keeping a job. That's that's her take on the whole experience. (laughs) Oh, I kind of love that. And you know what? That's why we have significant others to keep us to keep us well grounded. She's very good at that. Outstanding. Um, I know we're supposed to talk a lot about how how to make decisions, but I didn't know you worked at NASA. And I just would love a, a little bit of what it was like to work at NASA. 
So that, you know, if we want to talk about that in the decision context, and I've worked in the oil and gas industry as well, you know, when you, well, when you make decisions that involve <laughs> large sums of money, you know, in the case of shuttle operations, and even to a degree field operations in the oil industry, you know, there are a lot of obviously health and safety, you know, life um, and death concerns. You know, they take on a different kind of gravity and they become much more scientific. You know, it's, you have to avoid punches and you just bring a lot more, more rigor, I guess you could say, to the decision making process for sure. So you went from Air Force to NASA. You've been in tech for a while. How did you how did you make the progression into tech? So I, I uh, came up through school. I had degrees in geology and I went to work for Arc Oil and Gas back in, I guess it would have been the late 80s. And I was there for about 10 years and uh, it was about the mid 80s. And, you know, oil companies, you know, today in these days, it's um, fashionable to talk about the auto industry is really just a software industry. All you're doing, you're buying so the car is a vehicle to use so that software can be used to entertain you and induce you to buy things, et cetera, et cetera. And the analogy there is that, you know, the oil industry, yeah, you spend a lot of money to stick holes in the ground, but it's really a technology business. And the, the, the investments that are made both in finding oil and gas to start with and then producing it efficiently um, are, are tremendous. And so um, it, it, there's a lot of technology. And so long and short of it is, you know, tell people I sort of got a master's degree in computer science uh, during the time that I was there with Arco for that 10 years. And I, I never thought about oil and gas really as a technology, sort of the technology side and how much data you're going to have to have in the oil and gas industry to know where to drill, what to do and how that works. How, when you were in that how has the oil and gas industry evolved to use data in different ways and to get smarter about the decisions they're making? So the, you know, some of the core materials, no pun intended, that you use, um, you try to, tra try to triangulate, right? So you, you use seismic data to map the layers in the ground, and then you use, if you have it, data from nearby wells to try to calibrate and, and interpret some of the seismic data. Um, and what's happened over just the last, this is relatively recent, although it's been around for a while, there's tremendous visualization techniques now. So think of it like you can actually like walk around under the ground, right? And you can change some of the parameters that were used in the calculations of um, uh, assigning properties to some of the layers that are seen in the seismic data, et cetera, et cetera. So you can interactively play different games, you know, in a kind of a immersion VR, um, AR type experience to, help interpret the data. And that's that's pretty revolutionary when you, you really start to think about it. Now that's that's really, really cool. Um, and I could only imagine sort of, how do you even figure out where to start <laughs> with that? Well, you know, that's an interesting mental exercise, right? Because um, experience has shown time and time again, the people that really make the, um, the big bucks or have the big fines, you have to come up with a new concept, right? So by now, most of the earth has been explored to one degree or another. So there's a lot of information, I'm not everywhere, but a lot of places. And you come up with what's called a play concept. Like you have a new play concept, like nobody's ever drilled into that sandstone before because we thought in our modeling that it never got hot enough to bake the carbon and turn it into oil. But guess what? I got a new model, and if I juggle a couple parameters, I can convince myself that, you know, whatever it was several hundred million years ago, if I got just hot enough for just long enough, maybe that happened. And if I take some of these blocks, you know, earth blocks, and I come up with a sort of slightly different model of maybe the way these mountains sprang up and the thing got squeezed, maybe the oil got trapped over here, and nobody's mm -hmm. ever thought about that before. So it's really, you know, it's kind of like a forensic puzzle. and mm -hmm. It's it, the whole goal is there's a, there's what's called extension drilling. So once you found it, then you try to maximize the production from something you found. But that um, you know first first discovery experience is incredibly exhilarating. And uh, you know you see like in the Gulf of Mexico, people spend well, my lord, in the lease sales now is probably like hundreds of millions of dollars for drilling blocks, and it's kind of a guess in a lot of cases. They've just got an idea, um, and I've been involved in those kind of things. And some of those um, 
some of those auctions, you know, people look at each other like, what did they see that we didn't see? Like, we would have never, A, we would have never bought that block or gone in on it. And B, like, for that amount of money, that what what do they know? Where did we miss the, the bet? And sometimes you find out you didn't miss the bet. They put down a $100 million will and they don't get anything back, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of, it, it, it sounds like a dreary industry from the outside, but it's, you know, it's a lot of fun, actually. It's so interesting because it's a lot of what I'm hearing you talk about is that we have the data, we have all this information, we have 300 million years ago, this thing happened and this thing happened, but it's about the interpretation of that. It's about the insights that you can get. And it's the data is interesting, but it's interesting in as much as it's actually actionable and what you do with it. There was a gentleman who taught at Harvard. His name was Stephen J. Gould. And he was an anthropologist, and he had training in geology as well. And there's this famous rock outcrop in Canada called the Burgess Shale. And you're probably familiar with a shale. It's it's kind of a it's got like a lot of you know little little skin thinny layers to it, right? And you can see you've, everybody's seen shale in one form or another. So he went back over I think it was over like 150 years of the geologists who had interpreted how the shale showed up and that you know, how it was formed. And he saw there was a direct correlation. So if the geologists were working during periods when there was relative prosperity and world peace, the geologists interpreted the shale as having been laid down by very shallow seas over a long period of time. It just lapped back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and put it in there. If it was like during a period of major war, the interpretation was there was some kind of massive volcanic upheaval that had like done this like incredibly, um, you know, catastrophic thing to put it in. So it's a, it's a stunning example of anthropological overprinting, you know, the same data set, right? I mean, the shale didn't change. The shale is the, sh is the shale, but people with completely different perspectives came along and came up with totally diametrically opposed interpretations of how it got there in the first place. So just to illustrate your point, you know, there's tremendous anthropological overprinting probably in a lot of the things that we do. And it's the... It's so funny. It's, I think about that. And then I think about literally how businesses are run today, where you can look at the exact same report, you could look at the exact same data, the exact same piece of technology and come up with dramatically different interpretations of this is what I saw. And this is, so this is what I believe to be true. Right. Um, and, you know, and, and business investments too. Like, I mean, let's look at Peloton. I mean, who mm -hmm. would have said, I don't know, like 18 or 20 months ago, oh my God, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. I've got to get on the ground floor of like an exercise bike that they might dress up with a little bit of software, you know, that's going to turn out to be this, you know, who would have ever done that? You're a hundred percent right with, because if you, fundamentally it was an exercise bike and who was going to spend $2,000 on an exercise bike and then 60 bucks a month for classes for the exercise bike in your house. But, it is the how you re how people reimagined a problem, and it's the well, what are people really looking for? And if you are if you are working out at home, what are you missing? And is this going to appeal to people who are looking for that sense of community? And it is you can almost imagine the process of people looking at a bunch of data and saying group fitness is going up, people don't have you know time to go and do this. They are looking for the sense of community. But you know what? No one has time to go out and do anything. So let's add a TV and some software and stream some classes <laughs> on a two thousand dollar bike. And I mean, it's yeah. some of these that's other startup companies. You know, the, the, the one that kills me, which I wish again I invested in pet insurance. You know, there's some pet insurance mm -hmm. companies that are, are doing incredibly well. Uh, to my, you know, to my surprise, I would have just never thought something like that would have taken off. And this whole meatless phenomena, right? So meatless burgers and meatless. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I actually think in, it would appear that, I don't know, maybe like 20 years or less, there could be like a lot of nutritional products that you consume that are basically built from almost like the atomic or cellular level up in, in a lab. Type. Well, it won't be lab. It'll be a commercial environment, but it'll be under laboratory conditions um, in a commercial environment. It's fascinating. And so much of this, I just, I imagine in my head what people think of and see to get this. And it's that what piece of information, what data point, what was the thing that you pulled in and said, you know what? 
it's not about making better veggie burgers for vegetarians. It's about recreating meat to convert everyone who's a meat eater. And it's how they got that and what is the thing that sort of ticked over. Um, and then I, you've had so many interesting roles in your career and these sort of back and forth. I love the ping pong analogy. I had someone uh, once tell me it's like shoots and ladders where you just <laughs> go up all of these different ladders and don't be linear. Um, when you think back to your your own career and all of the different roles you've had, is there a time that you think back of that you go, I saw this data point, I saw this thing, and that gave me this insight and I decided this is my new strategy. I this is something other people aren't looking about looking at. I'm gonna make this call. I guess yes and no to different degrees. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people talk about the CIO role. Um, with all due respect to my colleagues, they sometimes almost attribute too much power and influence to it. And what I mean by that is, it's funny, I'm, I'm gonna have a uh, opportunity to speak next week. And I think one of the questions they want me to chat up about is like how the CIO role has changed over time or where it's going in the future. And, you know, I'm sure Gardner has published at least 12 reports about that. Um, but in the real world, <laughs> in a practical sense, you know, what you can do as a CIO is constrained by lots of things. It's constrained by maybe the expectations of the company that you're working in, you know, the kind of relationships and trust that you have with the other executives, um, the capabilities of your own team. I mean, you could have mm -hmm. a great you know, visionary strategy and guess what? The, probably the company's not going to let you fire like half the people in IT and start over from scratch. So um, you can see things, I think, yeah, you can see trends. So I, you know, if I go back in time, and I'm going to partially date myself, I mean, server virtualization was kind of an obvious thing, especially with 2020 hindsight, but it was one of those technologies that had almost an immediate payback. You could stop buying physical servers because you could like virtualize the ones you already had, right? So, I mean, it was a, a pretty easy call to make. And then really the issue just became scaling it as quickly as you possibly could. And, it, and you know, as broadly as you possibly could. And so we had great success in doing that when I was at BMC. And we effectively built, you know, our own private cloud to support all of our uh, product development activities there. So we made kind of an early call on that and push the push the button hard. You know, another thing that uh, we did when I was there, we built up an automation center of excellence, which I think people are familiar with today as a concept, but was kind of new there. So we had a dedicated team of people trying to think. You know, I mean, it wasn't huge, but I mean, there were about a half dozen people that were looking around primarily in the IT function for things that we could do on a more automated basis. And um, we were using some of our own commercial products to support that activity. But, you know, was, if you think about, again, the anthropology of that, that exercise, people were a little hesitant and reluctant to suggest automation opportunities or initiatives early on uh, for, I don't know, for different, a whole variety of reasons. But after we had some early success, I mean, we almost had to kind of bar the door. People came up with more ideas, um, you know, than we were capable of, of satisfying, both within IT and outside. And, you know, we started to have to introduce much more or quantitative ways of prioritizing the opportunities. You know, we'd kind of play hunches early on. Well, both a combination of hunch and like a willing victim that would come in and let us do something with them. You know, if we could put those two things together, then we could have a success. But, but after the prototyping phase, I guess you could call it, um, you know, then we had to put a little more rigor around it because we just didn't have the bandwidth to keep up. So, yeah, those are those are a couple of areas that come immediately to mind, you know, where, again, you see, if you see some early wins, you can go strong. And maybe the third one is, you know, think about it, is SaaS adoption. You know, when I remember um, a period of time, if I had, if I received a, uh, a business case for a new SaaS tool and they wanted more than 90 days to get it up and running, I would reject the business case out of hand because that's this is supposed to be easy, guys. Like, you know, what are we doing to turn this into a 120 or 180 day project? I mean, it's a SaaS tool, you know, <laughs> turn it on, put some data in it, you know, have a couple of like computer based training modules that are up on, on the internal internet and like, you know, let's let's go. Let's go. That was the promise of all SaaS. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, that's what happens these I mean, these days, right? I mean, tools show up and they're in. <laughs> they're in use and well 
for that's a different conversation. But a lot of times IT doesn't even know, you know, like what they, they haven't even heard about the fact that there's 50 users over here using some new applicant tracking tool, right? So anyway. And uh, it it is, and I think we could have a whole conversation about shadow IT and is it good or is it bad and how do you empower people? Um, so here, so wait, wait, I've written about this. So here's ooh. my here's my contention. Traditional IT is now shadow IT because mm -hmm. it's the the dirty jobs that primarily you know IT worries about these days, things like you know data management and security and. All the, some of the integration activities, those are all kind of behind the scenes things. Nobody comes to work and usually bitches about, you know, not having that, but IT kind of takes care of it. And a lot of the times the sexy stuff is being done out in the functional groups with the tools that they've, they've purchased and, you know, and they should take credit for having found, found some. And that's, well, you know, that's the other thing about SAS, right? It just, every year, it seems like there's a whole new um, regimen or reg uh, regime, regime of tools that are increasingly more granular and specific. Right. So take like expense management. You've kind of got your ERP tool, which might be NetSuite or SAP. Then you have an expense plan and management tool like Coupa. Then you have um, that, like the TripAdvisor tool that, that's, that comes yep. next. You know, and it's all the same stuff, basically. Only, not, you know, next there'll be one for hotels versus airlines. And then for hotels, there'll be one for like hotels in cities versus hotels in non cities. And, you know, the whole. SAS spec motivation wave will go on and on and on. And then you add in all of your planning software on top of that to say, well, this is managing expenses and now I have to do planning my expenses, exactly. which is different. Yep. And then the marketer hates the expense planning tool. So we get our own budget planning tool that doesn't integrate in anything. Yep, yep, totally right. Anyway, so that, you're right, that's a whole different conversation. But my point being, yeah, IT's responsibilities have changed in a pretty fundamental way, and there are new rules of engagement with the business. And, um, you know, the irony of this is when IT felt like, you know, we were, uh, what's the right term, profits wandering around in the desert of business talking about all the great things that information technology could do, right? Well, we kind of won, you know. Sometimes I tell people it's like Britain during World War II, right? They saved the universe from Nazi rule. But then after the war, they looked around and like they lost the colonies, their economy was a complete bust. You know, it's like, well, I, I thought we won, but wait a minute, did we really win? You know, I think IT, <laughs> IT should look in the mirror and say, oh my God, they're like using technology in like a lot of ways that we thought was a good thing. And now we're sort of disenfranchised. We're looking over their shoulders at the fun stuff. So anyway. Uh, that's such an interesting way to look at it because you are right. You did, the IT organization did usher the future of how we all do business and operate. And it went from, this is my horribly offensive oversimplification of, you know, how you're setting up and provisioning day-to-day -day work to, no, this is how you actually run the business and technology is how you run the business. And now you're the team in so many ways that's going, I'm going to shut down that application. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Let me spell GDPR for you, okay? Let me come over there and give you a little... <laughs> I, I, you know what? I'm regularly traumatized by GDPR conversations, so... Well, you know, Brazil, uh, Brazil just passed its version of GDPR went into effect in the last two weeks, so you're going to have to, like, expand your vocabulary. It's good. You know what? A little GDPR, a little CCPA, it's great. It's great. I... I want us to be as compliant as possible and to protect the privacy of all of our sort of prospects and customers. But it is it is not easy for a technologist to understand every bit of privacy regulation. And so much of it goes back to how do you control and manage your data? What's accessible? What's not accessible? And where does that where should that go? So I'm glad, so since you've opened this door up, <clears throat> I've actually uh, done some writing recently about privacy data management. And for all of our listeners that want to take a deeper dive, if you go to, uh, there's a, a venture capital firm in New York called Workbench. And if you go to work-bench.com, yeah, there's a, a white paper there that I'd highly recommend because I wrote it. And um, so here's a couple of fallacies that I think are in people's minds, especially in, if you're an IT leader. So first you think, well, if I've checked the box on GDPR and CCPA, I can't really have a privacy problem because it's all under control. Well, that's 
crazy talk because to your point, there are new regulations. Guess what? You know, this isn't like socks. We haven't had this for 20 years. These are only a couple years old. There's a gazillion court cases that are all trying to interpret what that really means. So there's all yep. that ambiguity. Um, at the same time, consumer individuals interpretation and impressions of what constitutes privacy data are changing all the time. Um, just in the last couple of months, Okta has put out an interesting um, white paper about a survey they conducted. So when they asked people, would you be willing to, <laughs> willing to share your web surfing behaviors with like a, a third party? Pretty much the answer was, yeah, my shopping behaviors, if I can get like discounts or, you know, a good deal by letting mm -hmm. people that want to sell me things, see what I've purchased in the past, that's fine. But as far as like my social dating behaviors or, you know, my religious beliefs or my political persuasion or whatever, keep your finger picking hands off of that, you know, whatever. I don't want anybody touching this. So there's all these nuances in terms of consumer perceptions about it. And so the so fallacy is it's not just regulation. Second fallacy is the infosec stack that you built up, which is almost wholly there to avoid the loss or theft of data is totally incapable of regulating its use internally, like how it's actually used. And that's the third problem, which is you can get yourself in trouble through simply the misuse of the data, not the loss, not the theft. It can be exposed in a certain way. And here's a concrete example. The attorney general of the state of Dakota, South Dakota is investigating a police department that actually got a hold of some COVID positive testing information that was never consented to by the people who tested positive. And they used that when the police and the firemen would go to as first responders into some kind of an emergency situation. They'd say, oh, by the way, you're going to a home where there's you know, a known positive, a positive case. Right. But nobody, the people who had tested had never consented to the use of that to their data. Don't get me started on this. You know, the other thing that's really crazy is, as you know, there are federal regulations. You as a parent cannot get access to the the grades of your, your college um, kids. They go to college, you pay the bill, they get grades. They have to give you permission to see the grades because the grades are their personal property. I think that's called f federal educational firma. I think it's called firma. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, anyway. Don't. So there's just a, you know, there's all kinds of tripwires that are out there I, and, and it's just going to get worse. And I'm going to get off of this, this kick in one second. There's, you're probably familiar with the VC firm um, called uh, Bessner, Bessemer Venture. Oh, yeah, yeah Bessemer. Yep. So they put out this annual forecast every year. And one of the predictions that they made this year was um, privacy debt in the IT systems will become the tech debt of the 2020s. And I just thought that is so profound. And, and the other thing I tell people is, you know, if there's one phrase that will send a cold chill down the spine of any IT leader, it's the word tech debt. And if you think like, there's another whole, like almost like below the water iceberg of crap that's about to be like rammed into, and it's this privacy debt stuff. You know, that just gives me a cold chill, just a complete cold chill. Oh, you're a hundred percent right because it's the, at least with tech debt, you can see it. The air quotes see it, but you get it. You know, if code is bad, you know if things need to be fixed. With something like I, this whole idea of privacy debt, it is. This is going to change all day, every day. It is a new space. It is going to change across country lines, across state lines. And how are you, how are you going to be compliant with all of these different, how are you going to be compliant with all of these different variables? Um, and you can be compliant today, but maybe not tomorrow, but you always want to try to be as compliant as possible. But it's how you interpret the data. It's just... It is a giant, giant, giant web. And I think there is this interesting future world where all of the privacy sits in the hands of, almost in the hands of the businesses versus in the hands of the, the individuals. So if we moved into a world where I, as a consumer, control all of my data and choose what to opt into and to give people permission and give businesses permission, is a very different approach to privacy, but we are a very, very, very long way from getting there. Right. You know, part of the CCPA conversations, which never got into the legislation, 
was the idea of your ability to monetize your personal information so that if somebody actually uses it, there could be certain conditions under which they would be required to pay you for the use of it. But that never kind of went, went very far. I, I promised you a last word, but I'm going to like break my promise. The other, <laughs> you know, I, I hope that we scared the, the listeners here enough about all of the ambiguity and chaos and you know uncertainty of, of what actually the problem, the dimensions of the problem. But then the other, you know, the, um, remark that I like to make hyperbole that I like to state is, is at the same time that's all that's happening in the name of digital transformation, you know, the most important mm -hmm. thing in the world, we're rolling out new collaboration tools all the time, new API integrations, spinning up instances in the cloud that can either transfer or replicate data, you know, at the touch of a button. So when you put those two things together, you know, what could possibly go wrong, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Just, just, yeah, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure everything's under control. I'm sure, you know. And I keep going of the like, is there a data governance strategy? Is there a, a compliance strategy around it? And how do businesses start to set uh, rules across their organization around from both a system perspective and from a policy perspective around um, handling of and data governance? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think Google actually has an executive position now. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is right. And it's a woman, her title is chief trust officer. Mm. And I think, you know, that's really sort of what you're trying to achieve. You're not trying to really achieve, you know, the, they have chief privacy officers. I think that's, yeah. you know, yeah. And, and there's other kinds of positions, but that's probably ultimately what the goal is. And so why not name the position after what the goal is? So it's, it's maybe we'll see more of those in the future. Maybe. And then theoretically, I want to believe that Google is trying to be on the forefront of trust and consumer trust with everything that they do and the fact that they know everything about us all the time, <laughs> which I'm you know, really comfortable with. Do you remember, I don't know if you remember this, but the, what's that big um, show that happens in Las Vegas, all the consumer electronics? Uh, CES. Yes, yeah. So I think it was last year over the, um, um, the Apple display. I don't know if you heard about this. There was a big banner and it, it said, what goes on your on your iPhone stays on your iPhone, and mm -hmm. it was a direct dig at Google for like telling taking information, not telling you what they're doing with it, and then making money, you know, selling it to other people. So anyway, uh, it's it's always interesting as um as sort of a a marketer, I'm oddly comfortable with businesses having access to my data and knowing things about me. I'm probably lean on the side of more comfortable to it because I like the personalized experience <laughs> and I like knowing I'm i uh, I'm remodeling my house right now. And I don't want to go look for 85 flooring options. I like that they all just appear in front of me and I go, well, you know what? I do need flooring right now. And thank you for knowing that I need flooring and telling me what are the businesses that I can get discounts on flooring. Well, here's the, the opposite experience or maybe the counterpoint to that. So, this happened to me. I think there was a day I downloaded a PDF off of the ServiceNow site. And then at night, I went home and got on YouTube and I got a uh, performance of the um, uh, symphony orchestra over in the Royal Albert Hall. It was a Beethoven symphony or whatever. And the first thing that shows up in the first movement is like, oh, here you're interested in ServiceNow. Let us tell you more. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wait a minute. You know. I'm not that cheap of a date. You know, my eyeballs can't be like sold. Like, you know, what did it cost for? Oh, you know, that's another privacy thing. I think the European mm -hmm. Union they brought a suit against um, two big firms, Google being one, um, that mm -hmm. they, they they cannot use data they're collecting in the course of operations to support ad bidding auctions that go on. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Ah, I just, I'm always particularly interested and curious in where it goes with how much privacy and regulation around data impacts marketing and advertising because i remember before we before all of this information existed the types of ads that used to appear and it was the dancing alien mortgage ads <laughs> i don't want the dancing alien mortgage ads i really do need new floors just help me narrow down and all i get right now are flooring and cabinets which is perfect because i'm buying flooring and cabinets right now <laughs> It'll get annoying after I'm done, but I also have this weird feeling that the Googles and the Facebooks of the world 
will somehow know that I've already bought, bought cabinets and flooring and it'll switch to something else, yeah. which is creepy, but useful. I had a, a idea for a business venture, which I think somebody's stolen, that um, you it's a subscription model. And effectively, if you provide information maybe about your credit card purchases and you know other activities, it wouldn't have to be terribly private. You'd basically get a surprise box from my company, like on a monthly basis. And I would try to anticipate things that would, you know, entertain or delight you that you don't know even exist, right? So I think somebody's actually done that. And then, and then as a household um, became wealthier, you could actually up the subscription, right? So if your collective income in the house is 100 grand, maybe you get a certain subscription where the box is worth 100 bucks a month or something like that, you know, and if you make more money in the future, well, pretty soon you're getting the $500 a month box, you know, and, and it's... And then you'll, and the, the ultimate goal is to AI, as you say, I didn't, I always wanted this, I did, but I didn't know it existed. You know, I always wanted one of these things. It's so fantastic. I think, but there's something like that. In fact, isn't, well, Stitch Fix does that on the fashion side. I believe, I think so. yeah, they get some information about you. And then I think they send you clothing that you um, can return if it doesn't strike your fancy. Yeah. They do. I am. Um... I wonder how that works now in a in a post COVID world where no one leaves the house. Maybe they're selling sweats. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. It, the the model has changed to a lot of a lot of yoga pants. A lot <laughs> of yoga pants. Uh, okay. So pivoting a little bit. Um, what's the hardest decision you've ever had to make at work? So, you know, I don't know if I can boil this down like one decision. But when I kind of look back, I think one of the areas of personal improvement that I would have counseled myself about if, was to just be more aggressive in performance management. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it obvious, I mean, it's easy to say this in theory, but it doesn't do anybody favors to carry members on a team that, you know, aren't pulling their weight. It's, it's frankly a service to them, ultimately. Um, it's not typically good for the reputation of the team because many of the customers that you serve on the outside frequently, you know, have enough ability to look over the fence at how your team's operating and are probably under impressed by this one or more individuals that are not pulling their weight. You know, the, their peers on a team are, you know, part of a dysfunctional family that are all kind of covering up, you know, they, they become, um, their behaviors have all transformed over time. So they don't, they're not even conscious of it anymore. They're doing things, you know, to, to do the work or the planning or the rework or the coaching for this person, et cetera, et cetera. So I think just in retrospect, you know, and I talk about this in the book to some extent, you know, you should always be giving feedback all the time. You, you should, you should find like bite-sized, think of yourself as a coach in a practice or, you know, Think about in athletics, they're getting feedback all the time. But, you know, practice every play that they run, looking at the film afterwards. The whole goal is to try to make, you know, the whole team themselves better and the whole team better. And everybody's, you know, best served under those circumstances. And to give people, you know, fourth chances and fifth chances and sixth chances and some coaching, even not only, hmm, again, your, your external business partners may be very underimpressed by, the quality of the people or the product that the team's producing. But, you know, even your own people, their peers look upon you as the leader. Like if you're not going to do something about this, who is right at the end of the day. And again, it doesn't have to be blatant. I mean, I'm not talking about some, but the situation where somebody is, you know, operating at less than 50% capacity or whatever, but where there's clearly room for improvement. Um, I just think with 2020 hindsight, there's lots of opportunities to be, um, you know, more blunt and, and persistent and frequent and giving feedback. And, and actually, as my career evolved, I mean, I evolved as well. But when I was at an executive level and I had vice presidents report to me, I mean, one of the principles I've operated under for a long time is pretty direct and blunt feedback, particularly in terms of perceptions that other executives may have about them or their performance. Right. So, you know, if the head of you name the function, head of marketing, just uh, 
made some kind of a subtle or not so subtle dig at the performance of somebody on my senior executive team, you know, I would just tell them, you know, you've, here's, here's the problem, you know, they get tired of asking for the same thing, you know, four times, or they you get, they've given you what they think is feedback and they're not feeling like you've either acknowledged it or acted on it. So I'm just telling you now, you know, you know cause those kind of things, once you know, once those perceptions form, if you don't do something about it, they persist. And then, you know, just wait for a year later, you know, something will happen where suddenly your, your presence is no longer required or, you know, you don't get the promotion you're looking for, et cetera. So it's just really not fair um, to people. But I think, you know, in the earlier stages and mid stages of my career, it's a hard, those are harder issues to deal with. You don't want to rock the boat. Sometimes you mislead yourself into thinking, well, I can probably help this problem and get it solved. But, um, you know, no third tries. I mean, if that, I mean, that's, there's a pretty common phenomenon that I think people encounter where if you do have an individual um, who's improved, whose performance needs some attention, you know, with a lot of communication and coaching and guidance, yeah, sure. They you probably get them like, you know, coached up to, to do a better job, but then like you can't, that's not a sustainable solution. So if you step back and suddenly six months later, some of the old behaviors or issues are surfacing again, it's like you got to cut cut the cord. I, I'm, you got me on this. So here's one of the other point I would make. You know, in a company like an Okta or any fast growing company, there's this phrase that people like to use, which is outgrowing people. Like we've outgrown mm-hmm. the, this person. They were great for us when we were 500 people, but now at a thousand people, they just don't have the skills or experience. And equally important, they don't seem to have the the runway. You know, the capacity mm-hmm. and potential to kind of get there. So um, in a larger company, what happens when people use the same terms, right? Like um, we, we're outgrowing people, but the solution in a big company is typically to just leave the issue alone and go ask for more headcount and kind of paper over the underperformer by just mm-hmm. getting more help. Or it's kind of this kind of a sick syndrome where you kind of pass around from one department to another certain individuals who everybody likes and they think he or she's a great person and but maybe they'd be better off in some other group so i don't mm-hmm. i don't you know so you kind of pass people around so they're really dealing with the problem or giving giving them feedback and you can kind of get away with it again in a big company that's not growing um, pretty quickly uh, rapidly but if if you're smaller you know and let's say like your renewals book of business has gone up 400 percent or the number of employees that have to be supported at the service desk has doubled in the last 18 months, you know, those kind of things, man, you, you, it's pretty obvious that, that some people are just, um, you know, stage inappropriate. They, they were great back then, but they're not, not going to work for us now. So I think that's, you know, in terms of, that's not a decision, but I kind of reflect back and just wish I had, and if, you know, the other thing is if you give feedback on a more um, frequent and regular basis, then it makes it a whole lot easier to have those, you know, harder conversations about, is this really the right fit for you and for us, you know, probably. And, yeah. and I've seen people, I'd say, oh, well, more than half the time, people that have been involuntarily let go have gone off and done some great things and had some great career opportunities, especially in IT. I mean, this is kind of a seller's market. So, yeah. So that's no, And I, I, I think you're completely right. And it's the we often think it's kinder not to give that amount of direct feedback and it's, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings or, you know, I like them a lot as a, (coughs) excuse me, or I like them a lot as a person. But if you don't know that your business partner in marketing has had a negative experience, it starts to be dry rot and all of a sudden the tree falls over and you are caught going, I don't know what just happened. Why, why am I not getting promoted? Why am I not getting laid off? And it starts with that. You didn't realize you didn't deliver because no one said something to you and you thought you were great. So how do you get better if you don't know? And there is also the part of you are right. There is a time where the role isn't right anymore. And rather than letting someone linger and fail, have the opportunity to have the direct conversation, give them the chance to get better. And if that's not the case, let them go thrive somewhere else where their skill set is better, is better suited. And I, 
I think performance management is incredibly, incredibly important. And we think so much about, you know, this is the individual with performance management, but we so often forget that you articulated so well is the, yes, it's about them, but it's about all the people around them that are carrying the extra work and carrying the extra load. And you're then taking your top performers and overloading them and burning them out. And you're going to lose your top performers because you don't want to have the direct conversation. You don't want to have the direct conversation with somebody. You don't want to give them that feedback. And it ends up doing more harm than good. And so many times as leaders, it's it's that little bit of fear or we're trying or a little bit too nice versus the kinder thing to do is have that direct conversation, give people an opportunity to get better and grow. And you're right, there shouldn't be fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh chances, because what you're doing is crushing the people around them, sending the wrong message to the people around them. And also for that individual, no one wants to fail six or seven times. If it's not working, give them an opportunity to be successful. And it may be in a different part of your organization, or it may be in a different company, but they will be more successful doing something else. You know, I can't tell you the number of times where after somebody has left either through a reduction in force um, or, you know, through a performance management process, somebody hasn't come into me and thanked me for doing that. Um, we had a, when I worked for ARCO, we had a, a large lab operation and there was a guy who was uh, using the results out of this lab and to cut costs, we shut the lab down and we basically purchased the service from a third party and we let some people go, et cetera. And he came in probably two months later. He said, you know, I never realized how much time I was spending down the lab, like sort of doing this quality control thing because I couldn't really trust them. You know, and all of the results of my, my work is based on the analysis of quality data. He said, now the quality's better because that this third party service, that's what they do all day long. He said, and I have really gotten like a lot of time back in the process. So, so that's one example. And here, I'll tell you one other st story about performance management, which is kind of funny. Um, when I was in the government, when I was working for NASA, I, <laughs> I was in a small team and there were several people on the team that were longtime civil servants. And you know, some of the stuff you hear or read about and the civil service is true. People kind of start to ease up a little bit after the first 10 years. They want to coast towards their 20-year retirement mark, right? So they're not young whippersnappers anymore. And for whatever reason, they've started to um, just take things a little bit on the easy side. So there were two individuals on this in this group who had pretty much, let's just say, hung it up. There was, there was one guy who spent his day... Uh, he would spend the morning researching restaurants in the Washington area. He would take the subway uh, and have lunch at the restaurant, and then he would come back and write a review of the lunch. And he was working on a book about you know the great restaurants of Washington, but he was being paid at the time as a civil servant with taxpayer dollars. And there were other cases that were sort of equally egregious. So the gentleman that I went to work for, um, he took this on. I think the the people that were underperforming or non-performing uh, felt that, you know, civil servants, they were, they were completely protected. Like it's impossible. Like nobody can ever, well, my, my boss was like, not on my watch. That's not going to happen. So long story short, he worked the process through. Um, and of course they, they kind of folded at some point of the process and, and went off and the whole thing. He got such a great reputation for that, that when we went in, in the in the budgeting cycle, which is right on the heels of their termination, I think we did better than we expected to, and you know, making and getting the money that we were requesting, just because like our street, well, I say our his street credibility was like so high, you know, they were like, <laughs> God damn, this guy knows how to run stuff. Like, let's give him some chance to go do some real stuff. You know, he's ready to shake things up around here. So I think that's, and again, you know, that's don't. Don't kid yourself. Your your peers at other functions have some pretty canny perceptions about the quality of your team and you know the quality of the work that they're performing as well. And if you show that I'm just I have high standards, you know, and I'm not going to tolerate this. You come to that next budgeting cycle, it's like, hey, settle. If you can go find more people like the ones you kept and trained up, like go for it. Get some more of those IT people. Let's do it. Absolutely, and it's setting that right reputation of you know 
every person that's here, I only keep eight players and we are going to hustle and get stuff done. And who doesn't want to invest more in that? Exactly. Couldn't say it better myself. Love it. Um, so I, this has been amazing and so interesting. Um, my favorite part of this, which is our, our quick hit rapid fire questions. What habit or hobby have you picked up since shelter in place? Easy one. I used to go to the gym in the morning and they closed the gym. So now I take a walk in the morning. You typically like an hour long walk and it's kind of, mm. it's kind of nice to be out outside as opposed to being in a gym, but it's good. It's great for the lower body, but I, I'm losing my upper body. Ah, uh, kettlebell. That is my, that is my advice for everyone. My hobby has been kettlebells. <laughs> I, need, in place. I need help. That's good. It's 15 minute workout, the best workout you'll have, but they're on back order everywhere. So it'll take a while, but we're not getting out of lockdown anytime soon. <laughs> That's true. Um, so what would you be doing if you uh, didn't go down a CIO path? You know, I, I'd probably be teaching geology at a university someplace. That probably, you know, the intellectual challenge of that whole field, we touched on some of those kind of things mm -hmm. early on. Yeah, that probably would be, I, I did, I did some academic publishing before I went into the oil company and went off to NASA. So yeah, I, I enjoyed doing that. I'd probably be doing that today. What? They'd probably, um, they probably what? be laying me off in the next, you know, year or so. So. Well, I would love a good geology class. Um, honestly, we need more things. <laughs> we need more things to do. Um, so uh, what is your favorite book or podcast that you've binged recently? So I have a short answer and a long answer for this one. Okay. okay. So. The short answer is, um, I think my cabin fever has gotten so bad that now I occasionally, I say occasionally, like two or three times a week, I'll get up on YouTube and go find a video of somebody that's either driving through or walking around someplace that I'm not able to get to at the, the current time. And I don't know if you've seen these videos, but the, the, mm. there's no talking. So it's a, all they do. So I had a home outside of Annapolis, and I think a couple of weeks ago, so I found a video, 15 minute video, somebody drove around downtown Annapolis. And I think to myself, oh, I know that restaurant. And oh, yeah, I love that bar. That was a great place. So that was, and then I think last week, I, I found a video where somebody walked from Covent Garden in London over to uh, Leicester Square in Piccadilly. And it was on a Friday night. And like people were out without masks, and they were like drinking and the whole thing. And I, I thought, Oh, my God, this is like, so cool. <laughs> you, know, you know, so that's, that's the short one. Now, here's the long, the long one. Did you ever see the movie with uh, Russell Crowe, Master and Commander? Oh yeah. So that's a, that's from a novel called Master and Commander that is one novel in a 21 novel set. Okay. Wow. I bought the set and I read the set. And if like, if there's a little like, you know, boyish or girlish, you know, part of, of any listener here that loves a good adventure story with like shipwrecks and espionage and people being double crossed and battles at sea and, you know, like just tons of action that go on. This thing, I think it was 6,000 pages because I would tell my kids I'm on page like 4,900, but, but I thought, when am I ever going to have a chance to do this? This is the perfect, perfect opportunity. And it just kind of brought out the little boy in me. I'm going to, I'm going to confess it, it was a great read. Oh, I love that. I have to check that out. I see my my binge has been far less interesting. I have been been binge watching Alias mm -hmm. because I never saw it and went, you know what? This is the perfect. It's back when TV series used to be 22 episodes a season. So I, I have a lot of episodes. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe this is me, but I I really have a hard time maintaining interest. Like a lot of these series, there's some initial character development, which kind of gets but then everything seems to plateau and nothing, and then I lose interest. You know, I get, it's like an, a season one, eight episode. And by episode six, I kind of find, well, I watched the first 20 minutes, then I watched another 10 minutes, and then I've lost interest all the other thing. I don't. That's, that's what multitasking on your phone is for. Okay, exactly. exactly. Um, my, my final question, and then I will let you escape, is uh, any advice for a first time CIO? Avoid micromanagement. So I think, you know, you use that first experience to try to prove to yourself that you deserve the job or that you're capable of doing the job. And you think the way to do that is to insert yourself into just about everything that's going on. And of course that undercuts a lot of the authority and creativity and innovation of your other leaders in the organization, which is what you should be working on. And, you know, it's kind of a classic case of, 
of getting promoted and, and still doing your old job, like in your new position, um, right? And what you, I think the three fundamental functions of a CIO, go get the resources for your team, manage the politics of the company, which will always be there, whether it's two people or 2,000 people or 200,000 people, and, you know, bring that, that objective feed, well, it's not, bring that feedback, especially to your direct report team about how IT is being perceived outside. Don't let it live in a bubble where they think everything is going mostly well and, you know, they've got ways of discounting some of the negative feedback that they heard from the marketing people. Those damn marketing mm -hmm. people will never keep them happy, you know, whatever. whatever. I mean, just, just make sure you bring the feedback into the tribe, go get the resources they need to be successful and help them navigate the politics or you go, you know, and that's, you know, that's the other part of the job is suddenly you have a new license to spend time with people that you didn't really have as a VP or a director, right? I mean, and mm -hmm. too many people think, oh, I think I'd rather sit in a conference room and have my own direct reports come in and show me a gazillion slides, you know, and then send them off to do two or three different things. And oh, maybe once a quarter, I'll schedule an impromptu drive by the CFO and just see how she's feeling about like IT, right? I'll give her my like quarterly um, touch up, check. Yeah. Check, in, check in conversation, you know. Hell no, you should be in there probably like every two to three weeks, you know, don't wait and do that like once a, every 90 days. Especially with the money people. The money people, they're important, so. Uh, no, this was an absolute pleasure, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us. Truth Be Known is brought to you by Talent. A leader in data integration and data integrity, Talent enables every company to find clarity amidst the chaos. Talent Data Fabric brings together in a single platform all the necessary capabilities that ensure enterprise data is complete, clean, compliant, and readily available to everyone who needs it throughout the organization. Learn more at talend.com. That's T-A-L-E-N-D.com.